Hey everybody, I don't have to tell you that people have perceptions of those of us that attend churches. Uh, maybe even you've walked into a church before and you've made some assumptions about the people who attend church. And here's the assumption I think, or maybe one of the assumptions many of us make about the people in the pews. They must have it all together, right? Don't we have that assumption about church people? I mean, you see that mom who walks in in her cute little mom outfit carrying her caribou or Starbucks coffee. You see that dad who looks like he just stepped out of a Shields catalog. He's got this perfectly manicured beard, uh, manicured just well enough that you know he took some time on it. And then they've got their kids, their kids, they, they look like they just stepped out of a, of a kid's gap store, all perfectly dressed, some of them even matching. Or if they have high school kids, they've got that son who's the captain of the hockey team. They've got that daughter who's the academic standout. You know what I'm talking about. When you walk into churches, we sometimes make this assumption about people that those church people, they must have it all together. Well, let me debunk that myth for a minute. Uh, let me show you a picture of me. This is me way back when. Wasn't I cute? Let's be honest. I was pretty cute. My kids say, Dad, what happened? Huh? This is me when I was a little kid, and uh, uh, this is my family. Growing up, I'm the oldest in the family. You can see where I get my hair cut, right? Uh, I think this is a bowl cut. I think that's what you would call that. But I was the oldest. Three years after I was born, my parents, they had so much love to give. They brought into this world my sister, Angie. And lastly, they adopted my brother, Steve. Our life was pretty good when I was a kid. In fact, it was really, really good. We didn't have a lot. We weren't all that wealthy. My dad was a pastor. Uh, but I think we were probably one of those families who walked into church and others went, they must have it all together. And that's really how it was until, well, until the year 1983. In 1983, my mom, who's pictured there, she was diagnosed with a severe case of lupus. And uh, they flew her to Rochester, to the Mayo Clinic, and they pumped her body full of steroids. The problem was, rather than getting better, she got worse and worse and worse. And it, when it was far too late, what the doctors realized is rather than lupus, she had a staph infection. And that staph infection combined with all those steroids, it would take her life. My mother died when I was just 10 years old. And that would throw our family into a tizzy. It would leave my dad with three kids, ages four, seven, and 10. Uh, and my dad, uh, let's be honest, he just wanted his kids to have a normal life. And so he jumped into a marriage far too soon, a marriage that would prove to be a really unhealthy marriage. And for 12 years, he was in that marriage during some of our most formative years. And let me tell you, I, I learned, I didn't know what a blended family was until somebody told me I was part of one. It was really hard. And at times it was really ugly. In fact, when my stepmother, when I was a sophomore in high school, she came to me and she said, Hans, I need to tell you something. I need to tell you that your dad and I are having a baby. And I'll never forget what I said to her. I looked at her and I said, why in the world would you do that? And what I was saying is that why would you bring another child into this dysfunctional, chaotic family that we have? Well, my dad would eventually go through a divorce after 12 really hard years for our family. He would remarry, bring in more stepkids. But here's the truth. All of us as kids, we dealt with it in different ways. I have siblings who, who dealt with the chaos of our childhood with, uh, uh, and have struggled with alcoholism. I myself, to escape, I jumped into a marriage far too soon, my first marriage, and would go through a divorce. Now, if you were to look at a picture of our family today, you would think, man, they've got it all together. Let me tell you the truth. We don't have it all together. And I start with all of this because, well, not to get your pity, but because I'm fairly certain the same is true for you. In your family, you've had divorce. 
or you, you've had some kind of a tragic event. Maybe there was a moral mistake in your family or a financial mistake in your family. You've experienced something, the death of a loved one. Maybe there's, there's a deep anxiety or depression that affects one of your family members and, and the ripple effects affect your entire family. Here's what I know is true. It's true about every family that walks through the door of a church. We don't have it all together. The problem is when we come to church, we have this idea that we're supposed to have it all together. And so what we do is we sit in our pews and we kind of hide our stories. We fear that our stories are going to leak out and others are going to find out who we really are, that we don't really belong there, that we're just imposters. When the truth is, for every last one of us, none of us, we don't have it all together. Now, why do I start with this? I start with this because this creates a huge problem for those of us that consider ourselves followers of Jesus. Some of you have been sitting in church all your life, and you've been hiding your story. You've been keeping it under the vest. You're terrified of it slipping out. And all the while, you've had some big questions for God because you've had these big monumental things happen to your family. You've had questions like this, God, how how could you? God, when this one thing happened in my family, when my dad ran away, when that, we lost that baby, when my, my son died in that car accident, God, where were you when we needed you the most? Or how about this one? God, why would you let that happen? God, if you are the author, if you, you have a plan for everything, God, why would you let that happen? Or how about this one? God, why did you abandon us in our time of need? God, you're just, are you cruel? Or how about this? God, are you really even out there? God, do you even care about us at all? You see, for every one of us, we've had those experiences in our lives and they've caused us, for whatever reason, when we walk into church, we believe that we have to have it all together. And so, so we hold these questions inside when all the while, if we're really honest, we have those moments where we say, God, if you're really out there and you let fill in the blank happen to my family, either you don't care or you're just plain In the 11th chapter of the book of John, there's a story about these two sisters. Their, their brother, uh, Lazarus, he's sick and he, he's dying. And so they send word to Jesus. And here's what we know about Jesus's relationship to this family. Jesus had a special affection for this family. In fact, the story starts like this. It says, so the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Jesus obviously cared deeply. Lazarus was one of his best friends. And so what we read next should be absolutely troubling to every last one of us. When we read this, we scratch our heads. We say, God, how could you do that? Or rather, God, why didn't you do something? The story says this. It says, so when he heard, when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he what? He stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Now, when everybody heard this story, just like you and just like me, they said, what? Jesus, how could you do this? Are you kidding me? Jesus, Lazarus is your friend. You, you love this family. Think of all that they have done for you. Think of the track record you have with them. You have history. How could you not go and help them? I mean, just two chapters ago, you, Jesus, you healed a blind man. He was a total stranger. And now you won't even go and help your friend, Lazarus? What's the deal? Well, after a couple of days, Jesus finally said, well, I suppose we should go. And as they're getting ready to go, Jesus says these words. He says, Lazarus, Lazarus isn't just sick. Lazarus is dead. But he doesn't stop there. He says something even more disturbing. Jesus goes on to say this, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I am glad I was not there. 
<laughs> Imagine those disciples said, are you kidding me? Jesus, you, you're just plain cruel. Jesus, wait till those sisters get a hold of you. There's not going to be anything left of you. You were glad that you were not there. What's the deal? Jesus goes on. He says, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. <laughs> and again, I imagine everyone said, are you kidding me? So that we may believe, so that we may believe what, Jesus? Now, let me pause for a second here in this story. Jesus said, he said, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that, what? So that you may believe. I want to ask you a question about this story. Who is you? Who's the you that Jesus is talking about, that Jesus wants to believe? You see, I think for certain in this story, it's obviously the disciples, but I have a hunch that it isn't just the disciples. Jesus is talking to you and to me, to you and me who walk into church and we think we, who, who we've got to have it all together. People like you and me who have these messy things happen in our lives, but, but for whatever reason, we can't admit it. We just, we just hide it. You and me who have had these pains, these hurts, these tragedies in our families, and they've crushed our faith, if we're honest. And while we're at it, here's what I think. I think Jesus actually orchestrated this story. I think honestly, I don't want to be careful here. I think Jesus actually engineered this story for people like you and me. People like you and me who have had these moments where we say, God, where are you? People like you and me whose faith has teetered, tottered, or maybe you've lost your faith. Because Jesus didn't come through, Jesus didn't show up, God didn't show up when your family needed it the most. Well, the story goes on and Jesus, he's finally heading to Bethany and and Martha, she finds out that Jesus is on his way and she doesn't wait for him to get there. She wants to give him a piece of her mind. And so what she does is she runs out the door, she meets Jesus before he even gets to town. She looks him in the eyes and says this, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus, it's your fault. It's your fault. You could have saved him. This is all your fault. Why did you abandon us? (laughs) Martha was so ticked, she ran back to the house and grabbed Mary, and Mary ran out and met Jesus, and it says much the same. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was, she said, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. Jesus, this is all your fault. You abandoned us. You were silent. And here in the story is where I think this isn't just Mary and Martha's story anymore. To be honest, this is, this is your story. This is my story. I mean, let's be honest, all of us, we've had those moments. This is, this is a story for you and me who have, who have leveraged the hurt, the pain, the loss in our families in one way or another to to say, God, where are you? God, why did you abandon me? God, why were you so quiet? God, are you even out there? You see, here's what I think. I think Jesus, Jesus engineered this story in such a way that you and I would know this isn't just Mary and Martha's story. This is your story, and this is my story. Well, Jesus saw that Mary and Martha, later on, they were, they were weeping. And the story goes like this. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also were weeping, it says, he was deeply moved in spirit, and he was troubled. And I imagine those who were looking on, they kind of looked at him and said, are you serious? Jesus, this is a little too too little, too late. I mean, really, you could have saved this guy. But then the authors included these words. It says, he wept. Now, these two words are the shortest verse in the entire Bible. Those who organized the Bible, they knew the importance and the power of this word, that without these, these two words, without us taking note of it, that we would miss the entire point of this entire story. So they made those two words the shortest verse in the Bible so that it would get our attention. 
And here's what I imagine. Jesus, Jesus must have wept uncontrollably. It must have been so audible. His body must have shook so that everybody took notice, so that John took notice and, and penned these words so that you and I would take notice that Jesus wept uncontrollably. And here's what makes this so odd. In that ancient culture, men just didn't weep. They didn't show any vulnerability. They didn't show emotion. I mean, let's be honest. You think your stoic husband, your Scandinavian or German husband is rather stoic? You have no idea what it was like to be a first century rabbi. They showed no emotion at all. But the story says Jesus wept. He wept uncontrollably. Now, here's what I imagine. When the people saw Jesus weeping, they sort of formed two different camps. There was one camp that looked at Jesus and they said, wow, he must have really loved this guy. He mu- Lazarus must have been more of a friend. He must have been more like a brother. We never knew this. I, I, I've never seen a grown man weep like this. But then I imagine there was another camp that looked at Jesus weeping and said, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Just a couple days ago, he healed a blind man. He didn't even know. This is his best friend. I don't buy it. Jesus could have kept this from happening. Jesus could have saved Lazarus's life. And I think that group, they didn't quite get Jesus's agenda. Because the truth is this. Jesus could have kept Lazarus from dying, but Jesus had a very different agenda. You see, Jesus' agenda was you. He orchestrated this story in such a way that you would know something about the character of God. Just a little bit later, Jesus made his way to the tomb. And of course, in front of the tomb, there was this huge stone. It was this gigantic stone. And Jesus says this. He says, take away the stone. And everybody went, what? What? You never take away the stone. It takes all this work, all this effort. It's there to keep the animals out. But Jesus said, no, 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 take away the stone to make matters worse. Martha was there. Are you kidding me, Jesus? Do you know what has happened to his body over the last couple of days? In that culture, there was no embalming. So you can imagine how nasty his body would have looked. And so Martha says to Jesus, but Lord, by this time there is a bad odor for he has been there four days. Jesus, please don't make us do this. It's just gonna add insult to injury. But Jesus says, take away the stone and they do. And there standing by the tomb, it says this. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here. And here's what I think. Jesus orchestrated all of this, not just for the people standing there, but for you and for me as well. And so he goes on, he said, I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe. And those standing there, I imagine, said, what? So that we may believe? Wait a second, Jesus, you had your best friend die. You had his sisters worried sick. You did all of this just that we might believe something? Believe what? And that's when Jesus finishes his thought. He said, I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And again, I imagine that crowd standing there, they said, wait a second. Was this all worth it, Jesus? (laughs) I mean, that we would simply know that you came from the Father, that God sent you to earth you had your best friend die. You, you had his sisters worried sick. You, you did this. Was it all worth it simply that we would know that God sent you into this world? To which I imagine Jesus would say, absolutely. It was absolutely all worth it. You see, I imagine Jesus would tell us today, if the Father sent the Son to show us what the Father is like, If God sent his son into this world to demonstrate who who this God is, the character of God, the love of God, the depth of God's grace and mercy, if the father sent the son into this world to, to show us what the father is like, then you can rest assured that the father weeps with you 
in your pain, regardless of who you blame. You see, if the Father sent the Son into this world, you can know that you have a God who enters into your sorrow, that regardless of what circumstance, what hurt and pain, this is not an indicator of the absence of God. If the Father sent the Son into this world to demonstrate who this God is, you can know exactly where God is in your family's hurt and your family's pain. And if God sent the Son into this world to demonstrate the character of God, then we can also know that the Father sent the Son into this world to show us what this God can do. And if the Son came into this world to show us what God can do, then the next words in this story ought to bring every single one of us hope and assurance because it says that Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And if you've heard this story before, you know how it ends. And the dead man, the dead man came out. Well, here's what I think. When it comes to this story, I think Jesus orchestrated, Jesus engineered this entire story for you and for me so that you and I would know without a doubt that our circumstance is not an indicator ever of God's absence. You see, if the Father sent the Son to demonstrate the depth and the character of God, we can know without a doubt that we have a God who is present, who weeps with us, who enters into our pain. And we can also know that those Sunday school stories we learned about heaven and about who we're going to be with there and what heaven is going to be like, we can know without a doubt that we have a God who has our future in God's hands. You see, we can know. We can know that our circumstance, it is never an indicator of God's absence. In fact, all that hurt all that pain, all that junk, that mess, any unforeseen circumstances your family might face, you can dump it all on God. You can hold on to God, even when it feels, even when it seems like God isn't holding on to you.
As we close our time together, I want to invite you to join with me as together we pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hey folks, thanks again for tuning in today. Thanks uh, for spending just a little bit of your day with us. It's always an honor to know that you, you chose to spend a little time with us today, especially if this is your first time with us. Uh, if this is your first time with us, we'd invite you to take maybe a ne next step with us. It's an easy one. Head out to our website, calvaryalec.org, and there, there's a button. It, it says sign up for emails. It's the easiest way for you to take a next step and find out about all the ways you can get involved with us here at Calvary, and we can connect with you. We'd love for you and be honored if you'd be willing to do that. Um, we are uh, sitting today, as I record this message, 39 days from Christmas. Uh, by Sunday, it'll be even less. We are getting closer and closer to Christmas. And so here at Calvary, we love Christmas. We believe it's one of the most important stories, if not the most important stories of our faith. And so we celebrate in all kinds of ways, from a kids and carols event to a coffee and carols for our seniors. We do carols and cocktails and mocktails. Uh, we have a night for weary hearts for those who are struggling with loss this time of year. We've got all these events and we wanna invite you to join us. Uh, we've created a special website, Christmas at Calvary. You can head out to that website and there find out about all the activities going on over the next month. Most importantly, we want you right now to begin to make plans for which Christmas service you're going to be joining us for. We've got six Christmas services over the week of Christmas. We can't wait to see you and have you join us. As we close our time together today, I want to invite you to make your offerings. We are just so grateful for your incredible generosity that allows us to do all we do here at the church. You can make your offerings in one of the ways on the screen. Uh, the easiest one is just to simply head out to our website, calvaryalec.org, and there hit the button that says give. And there you can sign up for a one time, or I'd encourage you to consider signing up for a reoccurring gift. It's the way you can be uh, most faithful in your giving throughout the year. Another way you can make your gift today is simply by using that app on your phone, Venmo. If you want to write a check, you can write a check and drop it in the mail to the address on the screen. Or if you'd like to make a special gift this holiday season, we'd love to connect with you. We'd love to talk to you about all the ways God is calling us to live the generous, a generous life. Folks, thanks so much for tuning in. Can't wait to see you next week when we kick off a new series, our Christmas series. We're calling it Reimagine Christmas. See you next week.